Shot of Versus. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm standing so far away from the camera right now so we can get the full height of this thing in the one shot. Now, as you've probably been able to tell from the title of this video, I'm going to be talking about a weapon that you might not have actually known existed historically, and it's this thing, the Sword Staff. I mean, just look at this thing, it is so awesome. And something interesting that I find is when fantasy recreates a weapon, basically just thinking about something, what is a cool idea? And I mean, we've got a spear, we've got a sword, what if we combine the both and made a swordy spear, right? And in actual fact, this is something I did when I was a teenager doing my drawings and stuff. I had a character who I wanted to use a spear, but spear seemed a little underwhelming. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'll put a big sword blade on the end. So I came up with this. And if I'm thinking of pop culture, I can actually think of, say, uh, the second Dragon Age game, the, the trailer for it. The character is using what you would call a sword staff, though his one is admittedly much shorter and he has a longer blade, but it's effectively a sword staff. Well, sometimes that same logic that we use in our own kind of pop culture and fantasy was a logic that existed in the past, but the weapons that were created are a bit more obscure and a bit more unknown. Say like the gun sword, a previous weapon we have covered in underappreciated historical weapons. So now we're going to be looking at the actual real historical sword staff in detail. First of all, it's obvious that the sword staff wasn't a common or widespread weapon. One of the more prominent accounts we have of the sword staff being used historically, it well, is from Sweden at the very end of the 1400s, turn over to the 1500s. So the latter end of the 15th century, beginning in the 16th century. The thing is though, when we have historical references of weapons like this existing, and the references are in written and visual evidence from iconography, that means that this weapon obviously existed for some time before we have this historical reference point. As to how far, we don't really know. And the idea is pretty easy to come up with, that I would hazard the assumption that that these probably have existed in other cultures, we just know evidence has kind of survived. So we can't say they did, but again, it's, it's a fairly evident idea. And if that is the case, why weren't they more prominent? Because one of the things is, if a weapon is more prominent, that means there's going to be more evidence of it having survived through the past, through time. And so the scarcity of historical references we have to the sword stuff does give us an indication that they weren't very common. But the historical reference point we have for Sweden in the late 1400s, indicates that they're actually quite prominent and they were used in large numbers in an army. So at least these people and this army specifically considered it a very effective and useful weapon. Now I tried to make this recreation as best I could going off the iconography, the visual evidence, and one of the tricky things that I had was trying to figure out the exact dimensions and size. So when I was looking off the image that shows this weapon being used in large numbers, the blades, they looked like the haft, the hilt, rested above their head height. Now they could have been holding it a bit higher, but I think, all right, I'll go off with the fact that it was resting on the ground. And if it needs to be shorter, I can just kind of chop off, uh, you know, a bit of this haft. Then the length of blade. And so again, going off the images, it looked to be around the 70 centimeter mark. Now that is very much within the realms of one-handed swords. Of course, it's on the shorter end of the spectrum. Here's one of the sword props I made a while ago. And this one was made to be kind of the standard length short sword. And comparing the length of blade, well, the sword staff is actually a little bit longer than the standard classic short sword length. But of course, when we compare that to a more standard range kind of arming sword length, uh, it's only a little bit shorter, but still, it's not by much. So we can most definitely say this is a, essentially a spear with a sword at the end. Now, of course, with any weapon, you will find variants. So historically, there would have been shorter ones and even perhaps longer ones as well. There would come a point where the length is just too long to be practical. So there certainly would be a limit. So I tried to make one around the most standard range that I could going off the available evidence. Now you might be thinking, what's the point of having a sword staff? Because there are other weapons that are more prominent that exist historically that are kind of, you know, sword staff like that they have a decent cutting blade on the end. Like, for instance, the glaive. Classic example, the glaive. Or what about the partisan? Okay, when you look at a, the, so these are types of pole arms, all right? A partisan is not too dissimilar to a sword staff in the sense that it's double bladed and that has kind of quillens on the end, but not really. They're just 
spikes, lugs or flanges you could almost call them. Well, the big difference of course is the length of the blade, the actual cutting ratio you have here. And when it comes to say glaives and even the Japanese naginata, those are single edged and wouldn't be nearly as effective in thrusting as such a finely tapered blade as what we see here and in the artwork. So the sword staff really does sit in its own unique category offering advantages and even some disadvantages that other pole arms don't really explore because of the length of the blade or the either greater focus on cutting or just pure focus on thrusting say with a spear. One of the things that I've noticed when observing kind of cuts with pole arms with a blade on the end the difficulty it is in aiming the strike just right so the blade lands. With say a pole axe you have a much smaller cutting Ratio. Same with the glaive, but when we look at say the naginata, the naginata is probably a better example of a sword staff like weapon because the blades do look to be and tend to be longer than the standard kind of cutting pole arms we see in Europe, specifically something like the glaive or partisan. These large aquilins are a very distinctive feature with the sword staff that we see from you know the visual references and of course their aquilins were a bit different, they had large curves on some of them, but the size of the cross guards on them were much much larger than the standard kind of spikes we see on other spears. I mean you even see on my foam you know training practice spear here these little wings on the end the, the classic winged spear and sometimes those wings can get much longer than what you see here even about further out yet that isn't nearly as wide as a proper cross guard on something this size. Having said that there are smaller cross guards I know I get it but I'm talking about what seems to be the standard length of the cross guard on a sword staff. And so the interesting thing about having such a large cross guard on a, a pole arm essentially is that you get the same advantages you do when out of, out of a standard long sword or any sword with a decent cross on it. And it's the big utility you get out of the cross guard in defense. In so many sparring sessions, practice matches and even you know Jewels, when I say jewels, I mean matches and stuff. A cross guard is such a profoundly effective defensive tool, blocking strikes coming in, and when you hold it, you know, up like this, you're almost covering your complete head because any strike is going to hit the cross guard unless it comes on a, you know, a round angle. But if you're keeping your sword on point to your opponent, uh, a sideways strike that misses the cross guard is not going to really happen. And most of them just land on this cross really effectively. And so this is a huge defensive advantage you have with a cross guard on sword. Now you'd get that with something the length of a pole arm. So you have the added reach of a spear, okay, keeping him at bay because of that. And then any like downward strikes and stuff like that. Wow! Like bringing it up and lower and stuff like this. This is very effective in blocking strikes. So a big defensive advantage with the cross guard. And one of the reasons why I kind of kept a straight cross guard instead of the curved ones is that if you just made these spikes, like you know spikes we see on halberds or even uh, Bechter Corbins, war picks and stuff like that. Well, if you come up against someone who has some pretty solid armor or mail, and you you know you're having trouble getting through it with thrusts, if you just went huge downward strike with the cross wow all right you like this already becomes now a more versatile weapon as a result now the only thing that i'm missing here is of course the accurate weight but in regards to the dimensions and the utility of what you would get out of this cool, this is a vicious weapon like really just kind of getting an idea of the reach leverage and power you have and i mean I was some kind of you know hesitant about how good of a cutter would this be but when I realized that the size of this blade is very comparable to regular one-handed swords and they get good cuts okay and then you have the leverage okay like with the length of the spear you would expect the cutting to be pretty darn devastating with this weapon. An interesting thing that I've observed in just kind of fiddling around with this sword staff and just getting an idea of the cutting right is uh, a kind of a problem that exists with the way I built this. I just bought this shaft from my local hardware store and what you'll notice about the shaft it's circular. And so because of that I'm finding it very difficult to index the blade properly to get the edge alignment correct. Now with a sword blade on the end of this staff getting edge alignment is going to be hugely crucial because when it comes to European swords that have more flex on them on average, not all of them but on average, effective cuts are almost necessitated by effective edge alignment. You need it and so because of it, it's so round I can't index the blade properly. Uh, it's very, been very hard I've been noticing just with my casual kind of you know mucking around getting an idea for this thing is that cuts have been coming in with poor edge alignment and so it should have been like that. And the other thing is kind of 
the downward strikes, getting like a, a direct line is kind of tricky with the angles that you, want, you would want to cut on. Yet still, having said all that, if you can align the edge properly, okay, and you would want, one of the ways that would help out with this in a huge measure is by having it oval, the shaft being oval shaped so you can index it easier. Landing a solid strike with such momentum that you have with this thing, the cuts would just be devastating. Yet, of course, cutting is not the only thing that this weapon is meant for. With such an acutely tapered blade, the thrusts on this thing would be easily as effective as a regular spear. So then, would the sword staff be a better weapon than, say, a halberd or a poleaxe, one of the more classic and iconic pole arms in medieval history? And, of course, the bill hook as well is, you know, thrown in there, very popular amongst the more common soldiers. Well, it depends really, it's a matter of context. With axe heads, they have far more biting power, right? They're, they're just cleavers, they can dig in real, they're, they're, so the cutting power is great, yet the disadvantages with axes, well, they're poor in defense because they don't really have def any defensive action they have, but that's kind of different with pole arms slightly. But the other big problem is that cutting ratio thing. But with a blade, a sword blade, much longer cutting ratio, much higher chance of landing that cut on your opponent. And, and if you have a cross guard like this, even if you overswung the you know edge of the cross is gonna jam in like it's just a big spike but as to the sword staff being universally better than a poleaxe I don't think universally no it would be hard to say which one is better and I'd actually my opinion on the matter would say they'd probably be about as good as each other and then it would come down to the individual soldier using him and their own personal preferences what they found worked better and how they use it now one thing that I'm not getting in this simulation is how top heavy this weapon would be because this would be a big difference between this and a standard spear spearheads don't need to be that big to get as equal an effective thrusting capacity out of them so you just got a spear you know tip about that big okay easily as good as thrusting as the sword staff and it would be so much lighter having a full-on sword blade at the end of you know a long shaft like this that's going to be quite top heavy i actually want to test that so uh all right we're doing it <laughs> <laughs> what have I done here? So I wanted to get at least an indication of the weight that would exist on a real sword staff regarding, you know, the actual cutting the business end, right? Now, I didn't want to use a real arming sword because this is not an arming sword, it's more closer to a short sword and you don't have the handle. And so adding additional kilo on the end wasn't going to be realistic. And so I grabbed uh, this one because I know that the rolling synthetics weigh 0.8 kilos. So lighter, far more in the realms of, say, a short sword kind of weight. Now, of course, this is probably still one kilos because of the clamp, so I might try with something lighter, but even on the most extreme end, okay, with this weight, let's see how that feels. And so, uh, uh, hang on, it's coming, it's coming loose. All right, I mean, it's, it's manageable in all honesty, but there's far more inertia, and so the speed in redirecting this, I like, whew, it's a lot slower, but because I can lengthen my hands out, this isn't me trying to hold it like a sword, I can hold it like a spear, and so it's actually just a matter of kind of leverage now, and still it's far more manageable than I was worried about. And so even with, like, this is basically a full kilo on the end, it's far more manageable, and you can redirect, you know, fast enough, you'll be able to thrust, go down with big kind of strikes. So, uh, you know, it's absolutely functional. You would get tired much quicker than say using a regular spear, but I mean, work out, you get fit. It is still a very functional weapon, even with so much more mass on the end. And remember, okay, this is, bl sword blades are thin. <laughs> okay, let's look at my own ones. Can you even see the blade here? Anyway, looking at it. Look it down, okay, very, very thin. And because of that, swords are actually much lighter than they look. When you look at them on, you know, this profile, it's like, well, what would be the weight? Only a kilo, very, very manageable. And so comparing that to other pole arm heads that already exist historically, like halberds, like pole axes, I actually think the weight on the end of a sword staff would be very comparable, probably the same even. And if not the same, the difference would be so minute, it wouldn't really have a massive effect on combat and functionality. So, would a sword staff be heavier than a spear? Absolutely. But would they be heavier than other standard pole arms that you see in the medieval period? 
No, not at all. In fact, because once again, the sword blades being so thin, actually it might be even lighter than the standard poleaxe or polearm in regards to the weight at the tip of the weapon. So all in all, just looking at all the kind of things that I can observe regarding this weapon, the sword staff, it is an awesome weapon, really effective. It existed historically, and so I reckon let's give this weapon far more love than what it really has gotten in pop culture, but even historical. Uh, when you go to the historical medieval period, of course, you're not going to see the Scots, you know, fighting the English with sword staffs, okay, because of course, historical period, this is most predominantly a Swedish weapon in the very, very late medieval period. We're looking at the right at the edge where most people say it crosses over into the Renaissance. But with fantasy and other things like that, Oh, this this weapon needs more love. It is an awesome, deadly weapon. It looks cool, and it's one of those cool ideas. A sword and a spear. Let's combine them both. The sword staff! So there we go. Thank you for watching, guys. I do hope you have enjoyed. And if you have enjoyed it, well, there are many other underappreciated sort of weapon episodes that you can check out. Hope to see you there. And until then, farewell.